Vincent's there uh, from the film Mini Lane. Um, there's a couple of other people from the film as well. Um, James Duval and Giselle Pratt, if you guys would like to come on and introduce you to a few of the other people. So, okay, so you want to go first? Um, I have a few questions and then okay. I'll throw it to the audience. It was a really fascinating film. When I saw it, I had no idea. I had no idea that this culture even existed. And it was interesting to me because it seemed like it started as almost a kind of innocuous, you know, teaching guys how to talk to women. It didn't seem so um, treacherous and it seems to have devolved into this predatory, uh, misogynistic industry. Can you talk about that evolution and why you think that it went in that direction? Sure. Um, would you like to look at that? I first came into the industry as a conversation coach, and um, you know, some of these guys, and you think, oh yeah, this is this is cool. You just go and help some guys get some get some skills. There was some other stuff other guys were doing. It mostly seemed addictive to me at first. It didn't seem malicious, and then slowly you start to see it unfold, and you see this real, real dark side. And you know, I saw this. I saw the industry start to go in a direction, and I left because I didn't like it. Um, and I actually kind of lost touch with it, and I've been off doing my own um, ladies coaching and personal development coaching um, from a more moral perspective. Um, and I didn't even know half the stuff that went on in the, in the industry until I was asked to be interviewed for the documentary. And then, you know, I wasn't really surprised at all to hear what went on. And I really thought I'd want to be a part of it and, and help people understand how slippery a slope it can be from, you know, this sort of teasing Meg into this really, really dark behavior. Um, have, has there been any um, support or backlash or anything from women's groups trying to get a hold of this? Has there been any you know, lawsuits or litigation against these people? Um, well, I mean, this is quite a, this is quite interesting. I think the short answer is that there are another a few pickup artists that have been sued by people that have discover themselves on YouTube or discover themselves as part of the product. Um, but strangely, there's been nothing, there's been nothing kind of widespread, uh, except for recently in the UK, there was actually one of the, um, one of those pickup artists over there has recently been um, in prison for, I think it was two years, off, off the back of um, a, a BBC documentary, actually. So it is, I think it is, I think there is, it does feel like there's a kind of a reckoning coming for some of this behavior. Um, yeah, but, but strangely that hasn't happened yet. Can you just talk to me a little bit about the, um, the filmmaking process? Like how did you come to tell the story? Sure, um, so I, I first stumbled, it was, a, it was a couple of things, I had stumbled across a few of the YouTube videos um, from Julian Blanc, who was the person in the middle of the film that the big scandal was about. Um, and I had a friend who was essentially doing the same job that the mini uh, used to do, which was be a kind of conversation uh, person at, at one of the one of the seminars, um, and 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 that was kind of the way in. And then I think I think for a very long time, uh, because it took quite a few years to put it together, and I think for a very long time I was I was trying to figure out, okay, well, you know, or we were trying to figure out rather, like where is this where is this going, you know, like, that. and then and then I heard mini on a podcast. Um, talking about ideas that kind of seem fairly self-evident, like the importance of self-worth and um, authenticity. And, and that was kind of when I thought, okay, you know, I have to meet this book, I have to meet her and, and, and include her. And I, I think that's that's where it should end up, you know. Um, do you want to talk about the first time we we met and I kind of said about, um, what did you know, do you want to be in it? Because and, and, you were a little bit hesitant, weren't you, initially? So I, until I was filming the, doc, the documentary, I completely dissociated myself from the industry because I didn't want to be associated with any of the stuff that goes on. You know, some of these guys, these guys that um, are in jail currently, they use the same job title as me. So I, 
uh, you have to be careful. And when someone says, can, can I interview you? You know, I don't know, if, if you don't really get the sense of that when you're watching the film, but I haven't seen the footage at the point when I'm being interviewed. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the industry. Um, there has actually been, I've, there's been backlash from some of the other people's companies in it, as you mentioned before. Um, I've also been trolled on social media a little bit for that. Yeah, how you came to sort of, I, 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 but I think we talked about it a lot in terms of, okay, if not, I, I, I think one of the things that you said, which I thought was very, very interesting is there's no point making the documentary saying the pickup industry is shit. You know, you, you need to say something a bit more than that. You need to offer something, like a, some kind of a solution or something a bit more hopeful. Yeah, yeah, that's why I wanted to be involved because I think it's, it's so easy to make a documentary that says, look at all this awful stuff that's going on. And, and I, I think the documentary goes so much deeper than that to actually explore how complex it is and some of the much deeper reasons for its existence. You know, if you got rid of the entire pickup industry today, you haven't solved the problem at all because the pickup industry is a side effect of much deeper problems in our society where people, you know, end adulthood completely clueless as to how to create connection with other people they don't understand how to process their emotions properly. Um, they, you know, they don't have any confidence. They, they're terrified of rejection. And we need, to, if we want real change, it's not about shaming and blaming. Actually, it's not about going. I mean, that that, that needs to happen. But if we want real change, we need to look at why it's happening and really start try to understand with compassion what is sucking people into this industry in the first place. What's probably not that clear watching this is that. The whole industry sort of supports itself, um, all the instructors, the students themselves. So it sort of feeds itself from the bottom with vulnerable people coming in, learning some tricks, and then passing them on to other vulnerable people. So we need to look at why these people are vulnerable and look at the gaps in our schooling system and in our parenting styles that mean that, that people aren't getting the love they need to develop psychologically into secure human beings. That's the real issue. Another aspect that was um, troubling to me about the film is, you know, there's the, the gender predatory uh, dynamic that's going on, but there's also this um, preying on these lonely men, just sucking as much money out of them as possible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, everybody in this system is vulnerable. The, the whole thing is sort of fueled by suffering and vulnerability, and, and it's, you know, you're teaching a system to, to teach people to kind of control that by developing a personality that's not really them. And that's actually making the problem worse, not better, for everybody involved. Because in, in order to do that, you have to detach more from who you really are to create this character. And that's being fueled by a fear that you're not good enough as you really are. So then we create this character, we reward that character because it gets girls, and it actually creates a positive feedback loop in the brain that actually reinforces that deep fear that you're not good enough in the first place. So you're actually making yourself worse. Um, and that's that's really, really misunderstood. And you know, I spent my whole life just like trying to teach this and try, try to help people understand. And people can understand, it's actually very simple to explain it to people. So your sort of mission is that <laughs> to show people that there is another way. I think also that's I think you know, pickup companies are very used to criticism, and the people that inhabit that world are also very used to being criticized by a mainstream media, whoever that is, or whoever they identify that as. And I think I think we really wanted to try and show the students as well that you are also being exploited here, because I think maybe that's the, that that might be the best way of sort of serving the wake up call, and make them actually think about their behavior and what they're involved in. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. If you don't have any. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of overlap, or perhaps an evolution of this uh, pickup culture of the students to what has now become a somewhat violent incel or involuntary celibate movement. And it, it sounds like you you almost say that uh, both that it's, it's a symptom of it, these lonely guys. But how much of it would you say that this is actually a cause? That these guys are pushing the whole alpha and beta thing that then evolves into this, this violent online community. Question of uh, chicken and egg, which came first, the, uh, the 
themselves or the teaching of this of this stuff. I mean, I say the whole thing is fuel for the same thing. It's, it's all coming from learning from people who not have the resources who are doing it a better way. Um, and because people don't have the resources to deal with it in a better way, they then trick to, to, to deal with it. It's not actually dealing with it. Um, and then again, as I said, it's, it's making things worse. So I, I think it's not so much chicken and eggs, it's just doing the same thing. Um, it's just a different branch of the same thing. It's just the, the root of people being isolated and lonely and not having any real tools to help to deal with, with this situation. But you, you know, there are tools. Essentially a drug, but that's what we found, spending time with these people. Um, what, what I kind of discovered was that these guys um, are, they're, they're being rewarded, um, well, much like a drug would um, boost a certain chemical in the brain. So rather than treating the root cause for the, the problem, the illness, it masked it. Um, I would, we, we lived with these guys for a while and that's what I saw in the field of pattern. Which I didn't actually realise until we started making the documentary. That's a great question, by the way. Um, I mean, just just to add to that, I think there's a bit of a revolving door between incels and the pickup community or or, or group or subculture, where because there are people within the incel community that you know they subscribe to the pickup programs, they they've been sold this dream of, and then they go on and they still don't get, they still don't find what they're looking for, which which actually makes them even even more embittered than they were previously, and there are there are whole there's a whole subculture of um, the PUA hate. I think was a, a an online forum that used to talk. I mean, it was people that had been to pickup companies that were very dissatisfied with their results, or, or you know, kind of their experience. But that's a great. That's a really interesting question. Wanted to ask you a little bit more about your process of making this film. Um, seems like you got pretty intimate with some of these pickup artists. Um, you got a very like deep level of access. Um, and surely on some level they must have known that you weren't gonna paint them in a very flattering light. So if you could just talk a little bit more about how you engage them, you explain this the process for them. The question is about how you engaged with the subjects and why they let you <laughs> film them in such a flattering manner sometimes. I think um, I think that's another great question. By the way, um, I think the I have tried as much as possible to be fair. We have tried as much as possible to be fair to the subjects in this film and not misrepresent them. Um, there were several instances with some of them where I said, "Look, uh, if I put this in a documentary, people are going to go crazy." I, I just want you to understand that you know, people are not going to react to this very well because I felt that in some ways I had to. It, almost it would be a little bit irresponsible. Um, I mean, there's a very odd dynamic, we probably don't have time to talk about it now, but, but there's a very odd dynamic between when you spend that much time with people, of, you know, it is, it is, it is, sometimes it, you, you, you I, I, we have tried to be fair, I think is, is, is the best way of saying it. And I, and I was, there were a few times it was very clear, um, one of them was Justin with the tattoos, and I said, look, if I, if I put this in the documentary, people are not going to react well to that. I just need you to understand that. And I think the thing is, a lot of, a lot of these, these their, their motivations are different. The, the most important thing to them is to be seen as the best at what they do. They don't really care what people think about them. Um, they, they view that as kind of lesser beings. It's, it's, it's kind of classical, sort of narcissistic. Um, I hope that answers your question. They're also so used to being rewarded for, for behaviour. I think you see some of that in the documentary, where because of this sort of cultish um, setup of, of the groups, um, you know, you see them in, in the film being racist and you know, completely degrading women and people laughing and applauding. And so they're so used to acting in an awful way and getting respect for it. I think they genuinely didn't really realise um, how, how it was going to come across to the general public. And they obviously do now, and that's why they're legal complaints to, to get their calls. Yeah, in their arrogance, um, in their arrogance, uh, what I found quite fascinating was that they, they they didn't see that they weren't the best ever, so they had this blind belief. Uh, for example, one, one of the instructors wanted to be an actor, uh, Reema Sultan, 
It's a hard thing to call a young athlete, you know, um, and you're going to be your next Olympia right? You're not going to be the ultimate role or anything like that. And <laughs> what was quite, what was quite funny was um, he. I don't know what she's talking about here, but um, he he believed that we were promoting it or promoting his company, his his image, not once did he say we were, we just were making a documentary. So he get everyone would meet with him, he'd be like, these guys are making a documentary, we're promoting what we do. And we were like, that doesn't mean to know what the fuck are you talking about. Not once have you said that. So this belief, they are best. Everyone wants to do everything for them. They're gods. Um, and that's what's carrying through with the students. And that's what's ultimately so dangerous. I think just as a final, sorry, yeah, just a very final point on that is um, we started filming this documentary in 2015. So this was this was before the Me Too movement and, and the, those kind of conversations around sexual harassment and uh, were, were they weren't really in the public um, they weren't really in the public sphere as much as they are now. Um, so it was it was a different yeah. Okay. We have time for one more question. Why isn't there more um, backlash from disgruntled customers? I, I think the sales model is very clever. Um, firstly, the, well, the fact that the, under, the industry is quite underground helps that because nobody wants to, to say that they've been on these courses. Um, they're just going to remove any bad comments. They've got enough people who are going to say good things about them. And, you know, the, the, the way that the, the businesses and the websites are set up is very salesy. I think also there's something that really can't be underestimated is a lot of the people that, that come into this are very lonely and isolated. And this is something that I, I hope we explain is that they find a sense of community, they find a sense of belonging in coming into this. It gives them, they have a common interest when they sit around. And I, I mean, I've been with students and they will, they've been, they will sit around all day and they will talk about tactics and you know as if discussing a video game or as if discussing it's it's a common it's a common interest yeah yeah so it's, it, it gives them it, and i think that's one of the interesting things is as well as this it, it, it sometimes it becomes more about the the community of men than it does the sort of the the, the, the women that they're they're pursuing yeah. i hope that answers your question very fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us and thank you all for coming.